today. Today is Thursday, 23rd November, the day upon which, so I understand, people in the United States celebrate Thanksgiving. Many of my American friends and many of my non-American friends who have been in the United States on the occasion of Thanksgiving tell me that it is their favourite American holiday. Let me take this opportunity, therefore, to congratulate all my viewers in the United States on the occasion of this holiday, on the occasion of Thanksgiving. The last 24 hours have, by all accounts, been very difficult for Ukraine. Apparently, weather conditions are now deteriorating, temperatures are falling. There's concerns that the energy system, the Ukrainian energy system, badly damaged during last year's missile strikes by the Russians, might not be capable of withstanding the strain if conditions become very cold. And, of course, this disregards the possibility of further Russian missile strikes on the energy system in Ukraine over the next few days and weeks. But anyway, Ukraine, people in Ukraine have to face the difficulties of um, changing weather, of falling temperatures, of snowfalls, which apparently have now begun. And of course, they face these problems in their civilian life, but even more so on the battlefields. And it is on the battlefields that the situation, so far as I can see, for Ukraine continues to deteriorate. So let me first of all do a quick rundown of what is happening on the battlefields. And let us start at the west. At the western end of the battlefronts are the Dnieper River in Kherson in Krinki. Now, yesterday I discussed how the Russians have now started using drones, suicide drones, at night, equipped with night vision devices to attack Ukrainian boats crossing the river to resupply Ukrainian troops holding this small bridgehead in Krinki and other Ukrainian troops trying to establish bridgeheads in other places on the Russian-controlled east bank of the Dnieper. And I speculated yesterday that these suicide drones with these night vision devices might be a local adaptation that the Russians might have improvised some method of giving these drones night vision devices for sp specifically for use at night in this particular area of the battlefronts and that it might not be a general thing for use right across all of the battlefronts in Ukraine. Well, a couple of hours, and that has proved to be wrong, because we are now getting reports that Russia has been using suicide drones with night vision devices at night to carry out strikes in other places on the battlefronts as well. And there have apparently been drone strikes of that nature carried out over the course of last night near the village of Novo Mikhailovo, which is a village south of Marinka, which remains just about <laughs> contested. But the Russians are also coming apparently fairly close now to capturing Novo Mikhailovo. And incidentally, if the latest reports are true, which apparently they are, that they're finally close to clearing Marinka as well. But anyway, the point is that in Novo Mikhailovo, they also used at night drones equipped with night vision devices. And these suicide drones carried out strikes on Ukrainian positions near the village of Novo Mikhailovo and in the village itself over the course of the night. And 
over the course of yesterday, I received a very helpful set of emails from another member of the Duran community, a trained engineer, and he provided me with two possible ways, one in particular, whereby the Russians might have been able to develop night vision devices for their suicide drones on an effective and cost-effective basis such that they could be produced on an industrial scale. And I must say, they did appear to be fairly neat engineering solutions. I am not going to discuss in this programme what they are. Um, I think that might provide some clues as to the person who has provided me with this information. And besides, I suspect the Russians want to keep this as a state secret. And even though I am sure that intelligence officers in the West and in Ukraine itself are busy trying to work out what exactly it is that the Russians have done. Nonetheless, I still don't want to get into the territory of speculating about what might be state secrets, military secrets, on either side of these particular battlefronts. Suffice to say that the solution or solutions which have been offered to me, possible solutions I should say, though they are cost effective and would be capable of producing suicide drones of this kind on an industrial scale, are such which for a variety of reasons I think Ukraine itself might struggle to mimic. Anyway, that's just saying. But anyway, the Russians are using these uh, drones, to cap with these night vision drones, suicide drones, uh, very effectively now apparently on the Dnieper River. They're able to destroy these boats that the Ukrainians have been using to send men and supplies to reinforce the bridgehead in Krinki and to keep that bridgehead supplied. And these boats, which the Ukrainians have also been using, with less success, by the way, to try to ma uh, land small groups of men on other parts of the Russian-controlled East Bank to try to establish other bridgeheads. And as Dima at the Military Summary Channel pointed, has pointed out, the fact that the Russians can now intercept and destroy pretty much any boat that now moves from the Ukrainian side of the Dnieper to the Russian-controlled side of the Dnieper and are able to do this day and night means that there is now effectively a 24-hour blockade on the position of the Ukrainian troops in Krinki, which, of course, puts them in critical danger. And alongside this, the Russians have been stepping up their attacks, not just on Krinki itself, where infantry, Russian infantry, backed by tanks, seem to be fairly actively engaged, recapturing buildings, houses from Ukrainian troops in Krinki. But also, of course, the Russians have been bringing down very heavy artillery fire on the Ukrainian troops in Krinki. Their flamethrower rocket systems are also in busy use in Krinki. The Russians have also been conducting repeated airstrikes on the Ukrainian troops in Krinki. Uh, Russian um, jets have been dropping precision-guided cluster bombs on the Ukrainian troops in Krinki. They've also been conducting increasing numbers of airstrikes on Ukrainian positions on the West Bank of the Dnieper. And apparently, yesterday, Russian Mi-28 helicopter gunships, which um, I understand are 
heavily armoured, more heavily armoured than the better known Kalmov 52 helicopter gunships, that they also carried out um, attacks on the Ukrainian troops in Klinki. And there are also reports or claims, I believe made by Vladimir Rogov, our old friend who is one of the political leaders in Russian-controlled Zaporozhye region, a little bit further to the east. Anyway, Vladimir Rogov, who presumably is getting regular updates on the Russian military about the Russian, about the military situation. He reports that more and more Ukrainian troops in Krinki are being captured. And he has said that without exception, every one of these troops is suffering from frostbite, which is remarkable and shows the grim condition in which these troops now find themselves. Now, I'm not going to make predictions about the tactical outcomes, or rather the timetable, of this particular fight in Krinky, or on the about these Ukrainian attempts to mount incursions into the Russian-controlled positions on the east bank of the Dnieper. But if this cascade of reports we got yesterday, which perhaps I should make clear, all come from Russian sources, are true, then it does seem to me that we are probably looking at the end, the beginning of the end of this particular battle. It doesn't seem to me as if this bridgehead can endure in Krinki for more than a couple of days, perhaps a week at most, unless, of course, the Ukrainians have something up their sleeves, the nature of which I can't imagine. Now, that, of course, begs the question of what this entire operation in Krinki on the east bank of the Dnieper was intended to achieve. I speculated in previous programs that this was all something that was thought up in that meeting that took place some months ago whilst the Ukrainian offensive, summer offensive, was still underway. That meeting that happened between General Zaluzhny and General Mark M um, uh, Milley of the United States and Admiral Radikin of Britain, that um, at that time the Western powers, the Americans and the British, insisted that Ukraine focus all its efforts on breaking through in the Zaporozhye region. And it seemed to me likely, very likely indeed, that it was all to be accompanied by an attempt to carry out an attack across the Dnieper, either to pin down or to put additional pressure on the Russian forces, and that these heavy supplies of missiles that Ukraine has received from Britain and France and the United States, the Attackums missiles, the Storm Shadows, were all intended in some way to assist in this offensive. And of course, Sladko, who is the Russian appointed governor, or rather I should say elected governor now of Kherson region, he says that the Ukrainians expected that they would not only establish a bridgehead on the east bank of the Dnieper River, but that they would be able to move on and capture Novaya Kakhovka and would be able to advance and capture Genishek, the capital of Russian controlled Kherson region on the east bank of the Dnieper River and a town, by the way, on the Black Sea, that they would be able to do that by some time in early or mid-December. So, well, if that was the plan, it has obviously failed. It has failed, or so it seems to me, disastrously. The Ukrainians have suffered 
significant losses of some of their best men in this area. Um, the Marines, the Ukrainian Marines who have been conducting these operations, appear to have become angry and embittered and are saying that there must be traitors in their midst. And, well, it looks to me as if the whole plan was misconceived, as indeed every part of the Ukrainian offensive, which began in Bakhmut on the 10th of May and in Zaporozhye region on the 4th of June, every part of the Ukrainian offensive has proved to be misconceived from the start. Anyway, that's my guess. Perhaps, as I said, the Ukrainians still have plans to try to launch some kind of um, further attacks across the Dnieper. I would have thought that the Krinky episode, the earlier episode of those troops who managed for a short time to entrench themselves close to the Antonovsky Bridge, but who were again were unable to break out or achieve anything of significance, that all of these events ought to have demonstrated by now to the Ukrainians and to their Western backers that these attempts to cross the river and to conduct operations in that way and to push through the enormous, heavily layered Russian defences, which, by the way, here also the Ukrainians have never so much as approached, let alone broken through, that all of these attempts are futile and waste men and resources and should therefore be abandoned. Anyway, that's the situation in Kherson region. Um, further uh, east, there have been more Ukrainian attacks in this bulge fire sack, it seems to me, more accurately, that the Ukrainians have established in the Verbovoye, Kopani, Rabotino area. And it's again a story of small groups of Ukrainian infantry trudging across the soft, wet soil, trying to find weaknesses in the Russian defences, which are mainly located on higher ground. And being thrown back with heavy casualties. The overall state of the losses in this part of the battlefront are not obviously comparable to what we saw in the summer or in the early autumn because the Ukrainian attacks, which appear to me to have become increasingly aimless, no longer have that level of force and power, but that makes their futility and pointlessness even more obvious. And if we go further um, west, east still, um, there's been more reports that the Russians are pushing hard now further on the Vremivka salient. Um, they don't seem to be pushing as hard as they were towards Staromayorsk and Urajainoye. Maybe they will resume that attack um, before long. There was more Russian bombing raids on these two villages where the Ukrainian troops occupy at least part of these villages and the bomb attacks were carried out by cluster munitions. But further east still, in Avdeevka, things continue to get ever grimmer for the Ukrainians. Now, yesterday we had yet another report that the Russians have now op actually occupied the village of Stepovoye, uh, west of the railway line. There have been several of these reports up to now. I'm not sure to what extent this one is true. There's been no confirmation of this from the Russian Defense Ministry. But it's clear that whatever Ukrainian counterattacks 
were taking place in this area, and there was talk of such counterattacks. It doesn't; they don't seem to have been successful. But elsewhere, in the industrial areas close to Avdeevka itself, to the north, around the slag, slag heap, the coke factory, the other industrial facilities there, and still more so in the southern industrial area, reports continue to pour in of more and bigger Russian advances and of the Russians now starting to penetrate into what might be described as the residential area of Avdevka itself. And again, one does wonder, as I've done so many times, about the logic from the Ukrainian point of view of this battle. The Ukrainians still clinging on to Avdevka, their troops are still there, but of course the pincers around them, both the inner pincers, if you like, that are closing in in the industrial areas, and the further pincers, the ones that, the further pincers, particularly the one in the north, moving um, up the railway line, moving perhaps to Stepovo, yeah, and beyond that, to Berdichi, steadily, incrementally, they're closing around these troops, still in Avdeevka. And Ukraine has thrown lots of reinforcements to try to slow or repel these Russian advances. What invariably happens is that the Russians repel these attacks, the Ukrainians suffer more losses, and on the back of these failed Ukrainian counterattacks, the Russians are able to resume and continue their advances. And the Russians are able to bring again to bear heavy artillery. They're deploying increasing amounts of armor to Avdevka. They're now coming close to a micro district apparently called Chimik, which is located close to Avdevka itself. Chimik itself has been apparently heavily bombed by the Russian Air Force. And again, I wonder, I do wonder what the purpose of all this resistance is. Now, I was reading in the Kiev Independent, Ukrainian newspaper, that the Ukrainians are claiming that 80% of Russian equipment that has been deployed around Avdevka has been destroyed. At least that was my understanding of the report. Um, clearly, that is not the case. The Russian advance con continues inexorably. I think that it makes no sense for the Ukrainians to continue to make these exaggerated claims about Russian losses, which obviously do not deceive the Russians, and which must be incurring increasing scepticism amongst Ukraine's Western sponsors, and which I suspect are beginning to lose credibility even amongst Western media reporters who have been covering this war. Because the reality is that the Russian advance on Avdevka is remorseless, and I'm not going to again predict any timeline here, I'm not expert to do so. But I've said already, events are moving faster than I ever imagined that they would do, certainly much faster than they did in the fighting in Bakhmut. And the way that the Ukrainians are conducting this battle seems to me to be sealing the fate of this brigade, this Ukrainian brigade, which is stationed in Avdeevka itself, and which is close to being sacrificed. Now I say that because 
again, I'm not an expert map reader, but if one does look at the maps of Avdevka, one notices a number of things which indicate differences from the nature of the fighting in Bakhmut earlier this year. First thing to say is that Bakhmut, much bigger place, was a much bigger place than Avdevka was. Bakhmut was a town of 70,000 people before the war. Avdevka is a town of around 30,000 people before the war. Most importantly, however, Avdevka, unlike Bakhmut, was not, is not part of a, is not the centre of a large, a larger urban um, conglomeration. So there are no places like Solidar and Kodyumovka and these other villages that ringed Bakhmut, which the Russian forces had to capture before they could capture Bakhmut itself and which took up many weeks of fighting before the actual assault on Bakhmut began. Abdevka, by contrast, can best be described as a small town which forms part of the Donetsk conglomeration, agglomeration, or conurbation, and which isn't therefore protected by other places, other, other inhabited places around it in the same way that Bakhmut was. And the other thing to say is that if you also look at the map, it's clear and has been, this has been true ever since the Russians captured the village of Krasnogorovka north of Bakhmut, way back Way, oh, sorry, north of Avdevka, way back in March, that Avdevka itself lies at an end, the end point of a long salient, almost a funnel, and that unlike Bakhmut, where it was at least possible for Ukrainian troops to withdraw across the fields towards Ukrainian positions uh, without having to brave Russian missile and artillery and small arms fire for an excessively long distance. In the case of Avdevka, if any Ukrainian troops were to withdraw now, they would presumably have to withdraw along this funnel and that would presumably take several hours or perhaps days and they would be exposed to artillery and missile fire and heavy machine gun fire throughout that journey. And of course, during the fighting in Bakhmut, the Russians didn't have drones that could operate at night and could monitor the situation at night and launch strikes on Ukrainian positions during the, the, during the night. What I mean by that is uh, kamikaze drones. They didn't have them, but of course they do now. And these would also could presumably be deployed and used as the Ukrainian as the Ukrainian troops from Avdevka sought to retreat. But having said that, with every day that passes, that retreat, which is already, it seems to me, incredibly dangerous and incredibly difficult for Ukrainian soldiers to undertake, becomes more dangerous and more difficult still. And with the Russians now edging towards the roads, with the drones operating over Avdevka all the time. I've heard reports that the Russians on any particular day have around 300 surveillance drones or Lantern 
surveillance drones flying over Abdevka, and presumably some of these Orlan drones are now also being provided with night vision devices so they can operate at night too. Anyway, <laughs> with all of that, <laughs> this whole thing is becoming extremely disastrous for those Ukrainian troops who are still there. And one would have thought that the priority for the Ukrainian command would be to get them out rather than to abandon them to their fate with no actual logic or purpose behind allowing them to remain there. It's been suggested to me, I saw this in an email that someone sent, and I think it's also been reported pu publicly, that the major reason that the Ukrainian government does not want to lose Avdeevka now is that it would be a shattering blow to Ukrainian morale if following all these months of Ukrainian offensives, the only actual important town which changed hands was a town, Avdeevka, which fell under the control of the Russians. Well, I can understand that, but as I said, is this really a proper way to conduct a war? Anyway, I'm just asking these questions. I don't suppose anything is going to happen that is going to change the outcome on the battlefronts now or will change the way in which the Ukrainians conduct this particular battle. And further, north, further west and further east and north, in Bakhmut as well, it seems that after a short pause, the Russians are once more on the attack, apparently trying to capture high ground to the northwest of Klesheevka. Um, they're pushing hard in that direction. And there are reports also that they're again um, resuming their attacks towards Bogdanovka and maybe seeking at some point to occupy Chromovo as well. So, more difficult news for the Ukrainians on that front. Less information, much less information about what's going on in Kupiansk, the most enigmatic theatre of the war. The Russians hold the initiative there. They don't seem at the moment to be in any hurry to bring that particular battle to an end. Now, Ukraine's ground forces, uh, overall military commander, General Zaluzhny, who is now involved in what looks like a difficult political battle with his chief, President Zelensky, apparently has recently attended another conference for Ukraine, a uh, military conference in, at Rammstein in Germany, discussing the provision of military aid to Ukraine. And supposedly he told the Western leaders there, the Western military leaders, that the, the situation of the Ukrainian army on the battlefronts is difficult, but it is under control. I am unable to understand that. Um, it seems to me that the Kherson offensive, if I can call it that, the Kherson offensive across the river has been, at least for the moment, a complete failure. And it seems to me also as if this town of Avdevka is now in the process of being lost. Perhaps General Zaluzhny does still believe these hyper-optimistic claims about the Ukrainians inflicting massive damage on the Russian troops 
destroying 80% of their equipment in Afghanistan. Maybe he actually believes that, and it is this which is giving him the confidence to make these extraordinary claims. I don't know. But could be that, or it could be that now that he's locked in this political battle with President Zelensky, he doesn't want to go uh, to, to deviate from the accepted script because he doesn't want to give Zelensky a further excuse to sack him. Whatever the reasons, as I said, it does, at least to me, give a further delusional quality to this whole situation. Now, there have been many rumours and many reports that Ukraine is on the brink of announcing this great mobilisation that I've been talking about in previous programmes. And so far, um, that has not yet happened. Though we do seem to be moving inexorably in that direction. But suffice to say that I saw on the Military Summary Channel a video of three Ukrainian soldiers being hard-pressed by the Russians close to Klesherevka in the Bakhmut area, and all three of them were women. And I have to say, again, watching things like that makes my heart sink. It makes me worry even more about the extent and savagery of the losses that Ukraine must be suffering. So there we are. That is the situation on the battlefronts. The situation is turning steadily, remorselessly now, against Ukraine. Um, back in the summer of 2022, when, during the fighting in Mariupol and Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, the Ukrainians could at least comfort themselves that they were getting vast amounts of equipment from the West, and that the uh, large numbers of men that they had been mobilizing, busy mobilizing since March, would soon become ready for the battle. There was a feeling in Ukraine at that time that the balance of numbers would eventually tilt in their favor, despite the heavy losses they were suffering on the battlefronts and the fact that the Russians were capturing important places like Mariupol and Popaznaya and Severodonetsk, Lysychansk. Well, perhaps the Ukrainians had some reasons for optimism at that time. But I cannot see that they have any reasons for optimism at all at the moment. The build-up is going on entirely on the Russian side. Militarily, industrially, aid to Ukraine from the West has slowly dwindled, in fact, rapidly dwindled. Austin's latest package of support for Ukraine amounted to no more than $100 million. The Ukrainian army, by Ukrainian, Ukrainian accounts, is now severely undermanned and the men are exhausted. And we saw that in Krinki, they're suffering from frostbite. So where are the sources of optimism now? A darkening picture, but no desire, obviously, to conduct negotiations. No willingness or thought about conducting negotiations. No incentive to do that on the part of the United States or any Western government. And since I'm on the topic of the United States, Global Times, the Chinese newspaper, has commented about Defense Secretary Austin's decision to go to Kiev and some of the comments 
he made whilst he was there. And this is what Global Times says about this. On Monday, US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin visited the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, whilst announcing a new US aid package. Austin also mentioned China, stating that if Russia is successful in Ukraine, China will be emboldened to use force to expand its territory in the Indo-Pacific. And Global Times makes the point, the obvious point, that you know all of this has happened. These words of Lloyd Austin in Kiev about, you know, we must fight on in Ukraine because if we don't, the Chinese might do something in the Pacific. All of this has happened just days after Xi Jinping met Joe Biden in the United States, in South San Francisco. They had that summit meeting in the Filoli country house. We were told that things were supposed to be getting better. And Global Times also points out that, um, well, I'll read what it says. Um, first, Austin's comments highlight the importance and support the US places on Ukraine, demonstrating that the United States will not completely ignore or abandon Ukraine. Second, Despite the absence of geopolitical conflicts similar to those in Europe and the Middle East, in the Asia-Pacific region, Austin still mentions China and the Indo-Pacific region. His intention is to remind allies not to focus solely on the Middle East and Europe, but also to pay attention to Central Asia and the Asia-Pacific region emphasizing that China remains a challenge that can't be ignored. So the United States still, despite what happened at the Biden Sea summit, still sees China as its adversary and rival, all talk of a partnership, all talk about trying to place strategic competition between China and the United States on a peaceful and sustainable basis, that all of that that we heard in San, Fr San Francisco is not really, from the American perspective, to be taken very seriously, and that the United States continues, therefore, to focus on China and that because it is so interested in China and has somehow linked the conflict in Ukraine in China on the, on the question of its competition with China, it will not completely ignore or abandon developments in Ukraine. Well, all that is probably true, but I will add something else, which is that these words of General Austin's suggests that Ukrainian men in places like Krimki and Avdevka and now Ukrainian women in Kleshevka, that their lives are being sacrificed not so much in Ukraine's interests but because they are pieces in this chess game that the United States believes it is playing against China. Ukraine, in other words, is just a pawn in that game. And contrary to what Global Times is saying, as a pawn, it can be sacrificed at any time. I find it astonishing that Ukrainians listening to Austin's words are not pushing back harder against them. Anyway, since I've brought up the topic of China, I should say that um, President Xi Jinping has been busy over the last few days communicating to the Russians um, the importance of the relationship between China 
and the unite and and uh, Russia. He has also uh, had meetings now a meeting in Beijing with Vyacheslav Volodin, the head of the the uh, speaker of the Duma of the uh, Russian Parliament. And it's unusual for Xi Jinping to go out of his way to meet an official of this sort. But anyway, he did. And um, there are photographs of this meeting between Xi Jinping and Volodin. Broad smiles on the faces of both men. Xi Jinping received Volodin in the Great Hall of the People. There are pictures of the Chinese and Russian delegations. And Xinhua, the Chinese state news agency, reports him as addressing Volodin in extremely favorable terms. It says that um, Xi said that China and Russia, this is from Xinhua, each other's largest neighbors and both permanent members of the United Nations Security Council share extensive common interests. This year, President Putin and I had face-to-face -face in depth exchanges twice and reached a lot of new consensus on deepening the China-Russia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership of coordination and practical cooperation in various fields. And uh, C noted that this is this year marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of China-Russia diplomatic ties. And he told Volodin that China is ready to work with Russia to deepen bilateral relations featuring permanent good neighborly friendship, comprehensive strategic coordination, and mutually beneficial cooperation to inject new impetus into the development of the two countries and contribute to the prosperity and stability of the world. And we then went on to read that Volodin said in response that under the strategic guidance of President Xi and President Putin, Russia-China relations have reached the best level in history, noting that all parties in the Russian State Duma have a high degree of consensus on developing friendly relations with China. Russia firmly pursues the One China policy. In other words, it stands full square behind China on the issue of Taiwan and firmly supports China in safeguarding national sovereignty and territorial integrity. So, I've discussed at length the meeting between Biden and Xi in San Francisco. We see that the Russians and the Chinese have taken immediate steps following that meeting between Biden and Xi to reaffirm and to publicize the fact that their strategic partnership remains as solid as ever, that there's no possibility of the United States creating gaps between them, and that that partnership remains of paramount importance to both. So there we go. So that shows that if the United States had ever hoped to use the war in Ukraine to undermine the Russia-China strategic partnership, the result has been the diametric opposite. And of course, if Lloyd Austin's worry today is that a Russian victory in Ukraine is going to embolden the Chinese in the Pacific, the progress of the Russian military on the battlefronts in Ukraine is quite likely to embolden them already. But anyway, if the United States made miscalculations about the Russian-China relationship and the effect on it of the conflict in Ukraine, 
They also have made further miscalculations about the state of the Russian economy and of the effect of the sanctions upon it. Now, um, yesterday, I noticed that a dissident Russian economist, Sergei Guriev, who is now in the West, has taken to complaining that three of his bank accounts have been closed despite the, uh, because um, of the Russian sanctions. These are Western bank accounts held in Western banks, but the Western banks have closed them, apparently because he is a well-known Russian economist. Now, this is apparently richly ironic because Zguriev is apparently an advisor to an, a commission, which I did not know existed, called the Yermak Makfall Commission, which has been apparently instrumental in crafting many of the Western sanctions. And the two chairs of this commission are Andrei Yermak, who is Zelensky's chief of staff, a person who many people believe is the real power behind the throne in Kiev, and Michael McFall, who is an academic, a former US ambassador to Moscow, a former advisor to Pre President Barack Obama, and a person who has got, got Russia wrong in almost every possible respect that it is possible to do, or so it seems to me. Anyway, I had no idea of the role of these three people, Yermak, McFall, and Guriev, in drawing up the sanctions. Had I known that they were involved in doing so, that would have made me even more sure that the sanctions would fail. But anyway, we've now received more evidence of this from the Russian government itself. And Putin has now had a meeting with the Russian government. And he's heard over the course of it a report from his economics minister, Maxim Roshetnikov. Now, I should say at this point that this was a colossal meeting. This is a meeting chaired by Putin with um, members of the Russian government. And this meeting covered a vast number of topics, tourism, uh, development of Russian brands, and apparently the main focus was on the development of the Russian shipping industry. Um, and that part of the discussion that concerned Russian shipping, um, we don't have a readout from the Kremlin about. But this is what Reshetnikov said um, was the overall constitution in the Russian economy and where the principal growth drivers are coming from. Um, Reshetnikov is quoted by the Kremlin website as saying the following. The Russian economy continues to show growth. According to a preliminary estimate from the Federal Service for State Statistics, GDP grew by 5.5% in the third quarter year on year. In comparable prices, retail trade grew by 11% during the same period because this growth is driven by domestic demand. At the core of this growth is consumer activity supported by growing production. Our companies have developed enough competencies to replace the products of their Western counterparts and boost their own manufacturing capabilities. To fill the vacant niches, they need to create, promote, and promote and protect their own brands, which is what they are doing. Now, yesterday I said, I answered a question. I've been asked by many people, what is the role of increased spending on the military having in driving this economic expansion forward. And I said that, well, obviously, the greater 
military spending has played a role. The main driver is a surge in consumer demand. And here we see the economics minister, Russia's economics minister, saying, saying the same thing. Now, this does come with problems. Um, Russia's inflation rate is now running at about 7.5% on an annualized basis, which is way above the central bank's 4% target. There are the first indicators that this inflation rate is going to start to fall um, over the next couple of weeks. There does, there does seem to be the first telltale symptoms that this surge in inflation is starting to run its course. But inflation has been high this year. And this is partly because demand is meeting supply bottlenecks. Russian industry, Russian manufacturing has not yet filled all the vacant niches that Reshetnikov was talking about. And what needs to happen is that the economy needs to cool. The growth rate, the growth of consumer demand needs to be slowed, which is why the central bank has raised interest rates, so that industry has the time to increase output to the level to fill the vacant niches. It's a complex trick to pull off, but what Russia undoubtedly does have, as now everybody acknowledges, is extremely skilled technocrats. They know their job. People like Rushetnikov and Nabulina and Siluanov, the finance minister, and they're as likely to pull it off as anyone is. Speaking of Siluanov, he has now come forward and he has now confirmed that the budget deficit this year, the Russian budget deficit this year, is only going to be around 1%. And um, this is from Interfax. Under the current budget law, a deficit of about 2.9 trillion rubles or 2% of GDP is planned for 2023. At the end of September, the head of the Ministry of Finance, Anton Silvanov, said that the deficit could come in under 2%. And at the beginning of October, President Vladimir Putin gave an even more optimistic estimate of around 1%. And Interfax goes on to say that Silvanov has now told reporters about 5%, 1%, sorry, about 1% is expected. Initially, it was 2%. Additional non-oil and gas revenues are coming in very well. The economy is working and growth rates allow us to talk about higher budget revenues. And we're told that in the period from January through October, the budget deficit totaled 0.7% of GDP. So we are looking at a 1% budget deficit this year, um, assuming, of course, growth holds in December, which it probably will. And, um, of course, this is a lower deficit that had been assumed, partly because, of, as Siluanov says, tax revenues are surging, but also, by the way, because GDP is going to end up, at the end of this year, higher than the government had previously forecast. So, I think the Russians, as of the time of making of this programme, have a lot to thank that trinity of Yermak, McFall and Guriev for. It's a bit ironic that Mr. Guriev is having his bank accounts closed on the back of the sanctions which he himself 
helped to craft, even as the economy he sought to pull down is surging. Anyway, there we are. That's the situation in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, continued Russian economic growth, Russian advances on the battlefield, a bad and deteriorating situation for Ukraine. Now, whilst I'm on the topic of the Russian conflict, um, I anticipate that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to ask me about the situation in the Netherlands, and I could just get to turn to that quickly. There was an election, and to everybody's astonishment, Gert Wilters and his party have surged. They've stormed ahead. They've won 37 seats in the lower house of the Dutch parliament. They are now unequivocally the biggest party in the Dutch parliament. And yeah, Gert Wilders himself has in the past spoken out strongly against the continued support that the Netherlands has extended to Ukraine. Now, this is an important electoral shock. It's a big victory for Wilders, who's been, well, I think he's now the longest, the longest uh, serving MP in the Dutch parliament. And he's a extremely skilled and charismatic politician. And it is indeed the case that he has emerged with by far the biggest party. But I think a word of caution has to be given, though this is a huge upset, and it represents, in some respects, a repudiation by a large proportion of the Dutch electorate of the policies of the previous Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, who had been, ru who had been running the Netherlands for 13 years, Netherlands' longest-serving ever Prime Minister. I think it is most unlikely indeed. I think it is all but inconceivable that Mr Wilders will be the next Prime Minister or will form the next government. It seems to me all but certain that all of the other parties in the Dutch Parliament will combine to freeze him out because of the proportional representation system in the Dutch Parliament. No party is ever likely to form a majority by itself, and Wilders' party comes nowhere close to doing so, despite being, as I said, emphatically the biggest party in the Dutch government. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a party, a government cobbled together from various other parties at the left, the centre and the right. It will be something of a Frankenstein's monster coalition. But even that, perhaps, should not make one think that it will lack coherence in practice. Today, in the territories of the European Union, parties of the left, the, the nominal left, right and centre, tend to agree on most things. Wilders, of course, does not. He has his own individual views, some of which I, by the way, strongly disagree with, but that's another story. He does have his own individual views, his own distinct views, but prefer Precisely for that reason, he's going to be kept out of power. And since I discussed the election in the Netherlands, I'm now going to briefly say a few things about the elections in Argentina. We've done a programme about this on the Duran, Alex Christoforo and I. That programme was made a couple of days ago, very much on the assumption that President Millet was going to indeed form a radical, transformative government. Well, as I've said, it looks as if he's now going to form a government based on that of President Macri. So we see that 
as I predict happens in the Netherlands. In Argentina, it will be more of the same. And he's already proposing that Argentina host a peace conference to try and seek peace in Ukraine. So there we go. That's what I'm going to say about this. Now let's turn once more to the situation in the Middle East. Um, the ceasefire between Hamas and, Ga and uh, Israel that was agreed on Wednesday and which was expected to come into force today has not done so. And the word is that this ceasefire will only come into force tomorrow. And I get the sense that the reason for this is that the Israeli government, that there are differences, arguments within the Israeli government over this particular, over, over this um, ceasefire, this humanitarian pause that has now happened. And I've now obtained more information about the agreement that was actually hammered out. And this is what apparently the terms of the agreement are. Palestinian groups, that's to say Hamas and Islamic Jihad and others, will release 50 prisoners held in Gaza, whilst Israel will release 150 Palestinians held in Israeli jails. And um, apparently amongst the Israeli prisoners, who do include civilian women and children, three hold US citizenships. The releases will happen at the rate in phases of at least 10 people a day. And we are told that the Hamas leadership has made it clear that as far as they're concerned, the priority is to get those who have been in jail the longest released first. So the idea that the Israelis are going to simply release people that they've been rounding up over the last few weeks since the events of 7th October, well, it seems that Hamas is pushing back on that. We then also go on to read that the no fuel and only a fraction of food and water and medical supplies have been allowed into Gaza since the 7th of October. This, the situation is now going to be eased and between two and 300 aid trucks will now enter Gaza every day during the period of the pause. This comparing with a, uh, a, a daily um, average of 500 a day before the war, with the Foreign Minister of Jordan saying that Gaza actually needs 800 trucks a day in order to make up for all the losses. But then there is something else about this ceasefire, this humanitarian pause, which I think might be the major problem for many people within the Israeli government and perhaps the Israeli military. Firstly, there is to be freedom of movement over during the period of the pause within Gaza um, so that people will be able to move from north to south um, um, and south to north, though the Israelis say they will only facilitate, whatever that means, movement from north to south. And then the Qataris are saying that there is already a mechanism for extending the ceasefire, the pause, beyond the currently agreed four days. And this has been confirmed 
by Netanyahu's office. And the mechanism is this, that there would be a one-day extension for each additional 10 prisoners released by Hamas and the other Palestinian groups after the end of the initial four-day period. And the Israeli government, however, has not authorized any extension of the ceasefire, of the pause, beyond 10 days in total. So we might conceivably get, instead of a four-day ceasefire, a 10-day ceasefire. And I suspect that this will be controversial for some people within the Israeli government and the Israeli uh, military. Now, all of this is happening directly after Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, has said that Hezbollah has carried out the biggest missile and artillery strike on northern Israel since the start of the present period of the conflict on the 7th of October. So, taken together with the military pressure that Israel faces in the north, the, this deal, which actually looks more favorable to Hamas than had first been reported, must be controversial with some people in Israel. And probably, I'm guessing, this is the reason why its implementation has been delayed. Well, it won't be delayed indefinitely because it is clear that this, has, this deal has the, pa the backing of the United States. And we've had from the White House a further readout of a conversation that President Biden has had with President al-Sisi of Egypt. And it both illustrates the pressure the United States is under and the extent to which the United States has had to back off from some of the original plans that Israel and the United States had at the start of the conflict. And I'm going to read parts of this readout, which are longer, by the way, is a longer readout than the United States um, generally provides. And it reads as follows. President Joseph R. Biden, Jr., spoke today with President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt to express his appreciation for Egypt's efforts to reach a deal for the release of hostages held by Hamas together with a humanitarian pause in Gaza. They discussed coordination to further surge humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Gaza. And that does suggest an increase in aid beyond the 300 trucks that we're talking about and perhaps a further extension of the humanitarian pause. Then we get again to the really interesting um, parts of the readout. The president reiterated that under no circumstances will the United States permit the forced relocation of Palestinians from Gaza or the West Bank or the besiegement of Gaza or the redrawing of the borders of Gaza. So this was what the Arab countries insisted on. The word, despite some attempts by various people to either deny or downplay this, there were undoubtedly plans in Israel to relocate from people from Gaza to Egypt, to Sinai. The Arab states absolutely rejected that. There were attempts 
there were discussions in Israel about Israel reoccupying Gaza, perhaps after its inhabitants had been relocated. We see that the United States has had to bend to the united pressure of the Arab countries and of the entire Muslim world and agree that, in the words of the readout, under no circumstances will that happen. Under no circumstances will the United States permit the forced relocation of Palestinians from Gaza or the West Bank or the besiegement of Gaza, that's the blockade of Gaza, or the redrawing of the borders of Gaza. And that tells us that the United States will not permit Israel to do these things. So that gives us some sense, of both of the pressure the administration itself is under from the Arab and Muslim states, but also of the pressure that it is now applying upon Israel. It will not permit Israel to do certain things that the Israelis had at one point considered doing and to some extent have actually been doing the so-called the besiegement of Gaza and that is apparently US policy and of course it marks a reversal from the position the United States was adopting at the start of the war. Now, having told al-Sisi that the United States will under no circumstances permit the Israelis to do these things, Biden also discussed Hamas in a previous readout with following a conversation with al-Sisi, the readout was silent about Hamas, something which I suspected, I suspect must have caused consternation and recrimination from Israel. But anyway, this time, Biden did say something about Hamas. The president also confirmed that under no circumstances can Gaza remain a sanctuary for Hamas where they can threaten Israel and Palestinians alike and imperil any pathway to a durable peace. That is an interesting formulation of words, by the way. Under no circumstances can Gaza remain a sanctuary for Hamas so that they can where they can threaten Israel and Palestinians alike and imperil any pathway to a durable peace. That doesn't appear to require the total destruction of Hamas, which is what Israel has been calling for. It seems to fall a step below that, but it does at least appear to address Israeli concerns. It says that Hamas cannot be permitted to launch more attacks on Israel from Gaza in the way that it did on the 7th of October. Now, to my mind, that opens the way up for a peacekeeping force of the sort that the BRIC states discussed over the course of their virtual summit meeting a day or so ago. The one that I spoke about, the one which brought together Putin, Xi Jinping, Cyril Ramaphosa, MBS, Al Sisi, Ebrahim Raisi. They were all there, all together, and they were talking about this, and they were discussing, amongst other things, the sending of a peacekeeping force to Gaza. And of course, Al Sisi attended that BRICS summit meeting. I forgot to mention Lula was also a participant. And it seems to me that Al Sisi is now conveying to the Americans 
some of the ideas that were discussed by the BRIC states over the course of that particular meeting. I ought to say there's been more moves in the UN Security Council. There's been more discussions of the situation in the Middle East. And by the way, and importantly, since I've just brought up the UN Security Council, Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, who we are privileged and honoured to have as a regular guest on the Duran, made a very powerful contribution to the debates that have been taking place in the UN Security Council. He made an important presentation there in which he pointed out that all of the various wars that have been taking place around the world, in Ukraine, in the Middle East, in the Sahel region, in Syria, are all capable of solution through diplomatic methods, and he made some important suggestions as to how that ought to be done. And it's a fascinating contribution. And I agree with the substance of the presentation, which I said I thought was a powerful one. And it is going to be a topic that we're going to be discussing with Professor Sachs himself in a future program on the Duran. But anyway, the point is that the Security Council remains, as it likes to say, seized of the matter of the Middle East crisis. And it is hearing from experts, one of whom, of course, being Professor Sachs himself. Anyway, more about that in that programme we're going to do on the Duran with Professor Sachs himself. So, we see that the diplomatic action continues. And since I discussed that virtual meeting that has taken place, the BRICS meeting, I should just touch on briefly that virtual meeting that has taken place, the G20 meeting, that took place the following day. And um, it's clear that, well, this was chaired by Prime Minister Modi himself. President Putin participated in the meeting. Prime Minister Modi skipped the virtual BRICS meeting, perhaps because he was preparing the G20 meeting. Anyway, he chaired the G20 meeting. Um, President Putin made a presentation. I'm not clear who else attended this meeting, this G20 meeting. The Chinese were represented by Li Tsien, who is China's uh, prime minister. Xi Jinping himself did not attend. But anyway, it was clear that Putin and Modi um, were, um, again, working together. And I understand that a visit to India by prime President Putin is now on the cards and that it might take place early next year. So this is where I finish today's program. As I said, a bad day for Ukraine on the battlefronts, um, deteriorating weather conditions, no real sign of any progress, any peace um, over the horizon. The Russians continuing to build their forces, continuing to make progress in Avdevka and Kherson and in other places. And in the Middle East, a continued complex diplomatic game in which it seems to me, or so it seems to me, ideas that are now being floated for a peacekeeping force are starting to emerge from the diplomatic haze. So a secure, a, a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza. Hamas still present in Gaza. As I said, the readout from the White House 
does not appear to exclude that. But Gaza no longer a sanctuary for Hamas where they can threaten Israel and Palestinians alike. That's what the Americans say. And that does seem to be consistent with a peacekeeping force. An idea floated, or so it seems, by the BRICS, especially by the South Africans, and, by the way, discussed also, not just about Gaza, but about the whole Palestinian conflict, by Professor Sachs in his presentation to the Security Council. If we see a peacekeeping force from the Arab states entering Gaza, the kind of peacekeeping force that we're talking about, then that will mean that Arab forces will be returning to the territory of what was once the British Mandate of Palestine for the first time since the 1967 Six Day War. And it will be in a different format than before. They will be going there under the aegis, presumably, of the UN Security Council and in cooperation with the Palestinians. The Israeli authorities will have to share the land or a part of the land of the British Mandate Territory for the first time with regular Arab forces since 1967. And that is an important development and one which may in time lead to all sorts of other things. Anyway, that is where I end my programme today. More from me soon. Let me re say um, what I always say at this point, that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also find our... You can also support our work, rather, via Patreon and subscribe. Start links under this video. Don't forget to go to our shop, where you can find... Um, all sorts of great things, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, all those great things. Links under this video also. And last but not least, please remember to tick the like button if you've liked this video and to check your subscription to this channel. And once more, happy Thanksgiving to the people, to people in the United States and a good day to everyone.